Can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah, okay, awesome. Okay, uh, welcome to uh, the last uh, uh, 2023, the last uh, uh, San Diego C++ meetup for this year. Um, super happy that I managed to do all of that with, uh, with all the busy schedule. Um, today is uh, December 12th, uh, 57. Uh, we started uh, the meetup uh, in beginning of 2019. I think the first uh, the first one was uh, on March 2019, so uh, approaching five years very soon. So when I um, when I'm uh, this is the agenda uh, very quickly. When I'm uh, thinking about what should we discuss, uh, I'm trying to balance between things that uh, uh, kind of a future design. I brought. Bryce uh, uh, Edelstein before, and and I also trying to bring tools related uh, topics. So we had Conan a few times, um, but I also uh, thinking of having uh, topics that everyone can take that and use it today in their in their uh, in their project. So that's that's an example. Like this this session, this talk is is something that you should be able to take. This is uh, uh, something that is not more than C++, but more than C++ is is adding more more better syntax uh, to uh, to templates. But this is something that even if you're not using uh, latest uh, standards you can you can pick it up and you should probably pick it up and understand how to use it because this is a very powerful tool that uh, you should be aware of uh, and uh, should, it should be part of your toolbox. So uh, we know the templates are awesome. Uh, we would like to show you how you can use it in a way where you have a host class that is hosting different uh, policy design classes and how you can create a uh, combinatorical uh, uh, class that can have multiple, uh, uh, you can create multiple types uh, using different uh, uh, different policies that you combine together. So that's that's how we're gonna, that's what I'm gonna show today. Um, if you're a new member, we meet every, uh, every month, usually, Tuesday, 5 p.m. Pacific. Everything is recorded and uploaded. If you wanna, if you wanna have uh, a topic, it can be something short, something long, anything. Just approach me, and and we can work it out. Uh, there's tons and millions of stuff that we can we can have. Uh, the uh, meetup is is uh, is taking fees. Uh, is actually. Uh, charging me uh, about 100 bucks every six months. Uh, this is sponsored by Qualcomm Wireless Design, uh, Wireless uh, uh, Development uh, Software. Uh, so thank you, Qualcomm, for sponsoring the meetup fees. Uh, I'm a Qualcomm employee, though I, this is not affiliated to Qualcomm. Uh, this is all my opinions, and, and this is everything is done on my, on my spare free times, usually nights and weekends, uh, usually weekends. Um, but Qualcomm is is sponsoring the 200 bucks every every year, 100 bucks every six months. Uh, we have a Dropbox, Dropbox link where I place the uh, rec uh, um, not the recording, but the slides. Uh, there is a Discord where I have an announcement. Mostly, uh, there are some discussions. Uh, SDCPP Meetup YouTube channel is where you can find uh, previous past uh, sessions. Usually within 24 hours, I'll upload the the session that I uh, uh, just had, so uh, you can you can have notifications if you want to. Uh, SDCPP Meetup Twitter. Uh, I don't have a Mastodon, but I have a Mastodon, my own Mastodon that I manage. Uh, Kobe underscore CA is my handle. I tweet about mostly about uh, C++, Rust, Python software development containers all of that stuff uh, 
just about just quick about myself. Uh, my name is Kobe. I'm uh, as, as I said, I'm a Qualcomm employee leading the uh, cloud AI 100 host user space software. We are using C++ 17. Uh, I also was a technical reviewer of uh, a book with Dorothy Kirk, uh, Deciphering Object Oriented Programming with C++. I think it's a great book. A bit biased because I was a technical reviewer, but I think Dorothy uh, did a, a, an amazing job in uh, uh, ex explaining object oriented with, with C++. I mostly helped to modernize the, the code examples. Uh, and and I, I had appearance in, in CPP class talking about 5G and containers. Okay, so today would be first part uh, of uh, two parts uh, session. Uh, so that in the next hour we will we'll talk about uh, the first part, which policy design. It is inspired by modern C++ design, generic programming, a book by uh, uh, Andre Alexandresco, uh, a great book, a great person to follow. Um, uh, this is a book from 2001 and, and I read it when, when it was uh, published. And I think this is one, probably the probably the major thing that I decided that C++ as a multi paradigm and a, and a, and a very a very uh, uh, good language to invest time. Uh, so I, I learned C++ back in 1997, 1998. Uh, this couple of years where where I actually uh, uh, been in school and and learned about C++. But this, I think this book was the, the book that actually inspired me to continue and, and realize that this is a very uh, versatile uh, language to, uh, to, to use and, and to invest time. So it, uh, when people ask me like, what is, what is a uh, material or book to, to read, I tell I tell, I, I, Usually point point out on modern C++ design, and the the at least the first the first two chapters are the ones that would blow your mind. It's it's a just the two chapters are pretty amazing. Um, if you're not familiar with templates and similar, this is going to uh, uh, give you a very uh, good introduction. Plus, that would the very good uh, foundations for for templates, and then the, the, from the third chapter and on, it it becomes more and more like the complexity increase. But if you if you manage to read the entire the entire book, you're probably a very experienced person in uh, in templates. So uh, so that's that's a that's the book that we'll we'll talk about today. Uh, Andre is an Nvidia. Uh, employee, I think it used to be also in Meta, uh, uh, Loki, um, uh, library. Uh, he was he was the one I think working on it. Maybe even the, the main author also working on D. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet him in person a few times uh, and discuss with him on all kinds of uh, things related to C++. He's a great guy. Uh, if you if you happen to uh, go to any conference, uh, just if you if you have a chance to discuss with him, he's, he's a pretty amazing guy to discuss about all kinds of stuff. So uh, so what do what do we learn today? This is again first part. Uh, we'll talk about using templates for policy compile time techniques, and this is basically instead of using runtime polymorphism. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, static polymorphism and, and how we can achieve that using policy uh, based design. So I'm not going to touch on some of the modern C++ improvements like if const expert and similar, not talking about Sphina. If you don't know, if you know what Sphina is, we'll talk about it in the uh, in part two, so don't worry about it. Uh, so uh, the book, if you remember, was 2001. Just before the uh, uh, the whole modern C++ was actually a thing. Uh, actually, uh, when I used to go into workshops uh, in Santa Clara around 2006, 2007, I remember Bjarne 
complaining, oh, not complaining, but just pointing out that the standard is not going anywhere as opposed to Java and all because there is no, not enough people to write proposals, not enough people to review proposals. There is, there is no big company behind this, this language. So uh, things obviously changed a lot. Uh, and uh, I think we are in the other direction now that are too many people pulling to all kinds of directions, I think. Uh, but but it, the, the language is making uh, a lot of progress. Some people would say it's bad. Some people say it's good. But this is this whole chapter is before uh, the modern C++. So I, I took some of the examples and I massaged them to have some of the newer syntax, uh, but just just the, just the syntax, the, the actual uh, idea is is coming from the from the book itself. So this book is actually forwarded by Scott Myers, which is very interesting. Scott Myers is a big name in in the industry. Uh, retired from C plus plus, unfortunately. Um, I I had the opportunity to uh, be in a workshop, couple of workshops that he had. Uh, uh, and again, is a, a, a great mentor and a, a great person to learn uh, C++ from, and, and unfortunately he, he retired. So he's talking about in, in, his, in, in his forward that he knew almost nothing about templates. Uh, he's not touching it in effective and more effective C++. These are the books that most of us know about. They, they used to be the Bible of, of the best practices of C++. Uh, uh, in 19, he, he mentioned that in 1995, there was a C++ report, uh, kind of a, uh, a journal that uh, that people used to uh, write about C++. So in 1995, uh, there was uh, uh, mentioning about templates, about zero cost uh, abstraction, zero runtime cost. Uh, Alexander Step, uh, Stepanov was talking about ranges and STL containers and iterators like pointers. And this whole thing was very new at least to him um, and probably other in the industry. Uh, this assert, for example, that he points out, uh, let me have the laser pointer. So this assert is interesting. We don't define the struct. We have, uh, 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 we don't have it. We don't have the definition. We have a uh, specialization of this uh, struct. And the interesting part is not what we have, but what we are actually missing. So there are all kinds of tricks with C++ templates about what is actually missing and not what actually we have, which is which is a, an interesting point. Uh, he also talks about Andre's Loki library, which I already mentioned. And then he he's talking about policy classes and smart pointers and singletons and similar uh, that uh, the book would would uh, present ideas about how to implement them. Uh, there was another person named John V, and he also had another, uh, there's another forward on the book, uh, talks about uh, template metaprogramming. It's basically a code that generates code, and by that uh, you can actually have code that is with less bugs because the machine is generating it. You can argue if this is correct or not, but this is what he said. Uh, and and obviously there is more benefits if machine generates code. Like you write code to generate another code, and most likely the, the generated code would be bug free or less bugs because it's generated by by machine and not human. Um, he also mentioned about and we'll see that we'll we'll, we'll talk about it about policy design, uh, how you can mix policies and how you can uh, uh, create very verbose templates classes. So let's dive into that, the, the idea of policy-based class design and how you can use it in your uh, applications, your day job, starting today. If you don't, if you're not familiar with that, so the idea behind uh, policy-based class design is that you have a host class, and you have small, uh, other small classes. We call them policy. They they modeled after a specific behavior. So the policy is a, a specific behavior, and this behavior can be can be done in multiple ways, and you model each way in a different small policy class. And we'll see how we 
uh, combine multiple policy classes into a, a single host class that would host all the policies. So, so these small classes would host, uh, so, sorry, small classes would take care of the behavioral, maybe structural aspect, would, would show how we can do that. Uh, plus, these policy classes would have a specific, well defined API, will show how we can enrich API for different policy classes and how it actually works well with uh, C rules that related to templates. Uh, we can mix and match different behaviors and the examples that we would have would be related to lifetime, threat safety, and there is also a major uh, technique, which is like a no op policy, like you can have a specific policy, which is a specific behavior and you can have a counterpart, which is no op uh, policy. And uh, there are multiple examples today in the industry, how we can do that or how you do that. It's pretty simple and it's very, very powerful. Uh, when you think about policy design, the, the parallel approach that came to mind, come to mind is basically uh, a uh, few few options. One is one class mammoth class that is like all interface, do it all class, which is obviously not the best approach. It's brittle. It's uh, it's very hard to uh, customize. It's not the right thing to do. Like think about one big class that has that has multiple behavior. It obviously. Uh, breaks the whole solid, the SRP, the single responsibility. This is not the best way to design your app. There is also another approach where you, instead of having templates, you can have runtime polymorphism. There's a lot of bad aspects. Like, runtime polymorphism is, is a great approach when it's done correctly, when it's done in the right context. It's, it's really great. However, you can always ask yourself when you, when you reach out to runtime polymorphism, ask yourself if this is, uh, if you can do that, the get, get the same result, but with with a static polymorphism. Uh, there are multiple uh, uh, pros and cons for each. The idea behind um, uh, templates is there is a static typing, uh, you know about the type, static polymorphism, like the base class doesn't know about the, the, the derived. So, so the base class sometimes cannot make any assumptions about the derived. Uh, uh, while if you use templates, you 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 have more knowledge about the types that you're actually working with because it's all compile time uh, techniques. Um, some of you would think about multiple inheritance. Multiple inheritance. First of all, inheritance has runtime cost. There's a virtual functions. There is another uh, uh, virtual. Uh, pointer, there's a size cost, uh, so is, there is a space and time cost, uh, unlike uh, policy based design that will uh, demonstrate uh, multiple inheritance. Again, it's 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 really hard to get it right. Sometimes you need to have virtual inheritance uh, to solve a state that you have in base classes. Usually you want to move away from state in base classes just because in multiple inheritance, you need to uh, uh, reach out to virtual inheritance in order to solve the double state, especially in diamond and similar. Uh, so it complicated the design. Definitely policy based classes makes things so much easy. Lots of compile time checks and uh, you don't pay uh, runtime and, 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 and and space cost as as you would in um, in uh, run type polymorphism like in virtual functions. So let's dive into an example. And the example that we have, the first one is smart pointers. So uh, PNU is the class template parameter, and the the first thing that we would like to point out is what you can do in order to specialize a class. You can basically have your uh, main template class type, which is the 
the one above, but you can specialize that. You can say, OK, I know what T is and I'm I'm going to have a different implementation. To uh, uh, a smart pointer class that has a widget as T, but some U. Uh, so this is this is a great and a powerful way to customize your class templates. You cannot specialize a structure. You cannot specialize the structure like the data members. Uh, you can specialize functions. Um, you cannot partial specialize member function. Uh, oh, you can, but it's it's not basically going to scale well. Like you can't do that, but it's not going to scale well. Let's let's see an example. So this is uh, a simpler a simpler class template uh, T. It's a widget and has some generic implementation. When I say generic imp implementation, the author provides default implementation to class widget. So if I instantiate widget with some T, let's say an int, I'm getting some default implementation of the functions that the author of the class implemented. Now I can specialize a widget uh, with character and say, okay, for if if widget is instantiated with character, function fun would have different implementation, different than what the author gave me as a default. Now the author cannot give me multiple defaults, just one default, and I can override this, not override, not in the virtual manner, but I can actually replace that, replace that uh, implementation. Um, and this is the specialization. Now here's another, uh, another example. Now we have two of them. Uh, we cannot partially, partially specialize a member function like this one. OK, so we can fully specialize it, but not uh, partially specialize the member function of gadget. So that's one of the uh, uh, disadvantages we have, or, or maybe restrictions, I would say, uh, on templates. OK, so now we get into the real thing about this talk. Creating policy objects, combining them into one, creating a host class to host the, the, the policies and uh, and combining multiple of them. So let's start with a single policy, creation policy. So let's say I have multiple ways or my design would like to support multiple ways of creating a specific type. So here, here are three options to create a type. One option is just new, just operator new. Very, very simple. So this would this would be the first, the first one here. The second one is malloc, just just malloc, not new, not operator new, but malloc, and then uh, have a, a placement new called. It's another it's another option. It's a malloc. The name is malloc creator. And then the third one is prototype creator. Prototype creator is pretty simple. Uh, I can have a clone function. So, so if you if you look at that, T is the prototype, and T should have a clone function that returns a cloned uh, instance. And this is what I'm going to retain in the create function. Now, few observations right off the bat. Uh, you can see that these two are sta static. Which is fine, no no issue with that. Just static, just because they don't touch any of any of. There is no members data members to touch. That's fine. Uh, so they are basically static. The only one that is not static is here. This create is not static. Why? If I have a prototype, I'll clone it. If not, I'll return an out pointer. The second observation that you can see here is that. In the first two, I have only single function create, but on the prototype creator uh, policy class, I have get prototype and set prototype. We'll talk about it a bit more, but this is basically what we call an enriched interface to a specific policy. 
Uh, you can see that all the API is loosely defined. There is no virtual functions. Um, obviously, everything here that we use as a T, T is the template parameter, need, need to support what we are actually doing with it. So uh, here is like the T needs to needs to have a clone function. If it doesn't have a clone function, what do you think would happen if I use prototype creator? It's going to be, we're going to get a, a compiler or so. It's not a runtime error, but it's a compiler or that. Oh, you're using prototype creator and there is no clone to the to the T that you that you passing. So we'll see what does it mean when we when we start using uh, different T's and and using also the enriched interface. Um, yeah. So so if you look at the book, the book would have null instead of null pointer and maybe other things. I kind of modernized the 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 code snippet to to be a bit more modern. Including here, there is a type def instead of using. I'm using. I'm using using instead of type def. There is another thing, by the way. Before C++ uh, 11, if you remember, we couldn't have these angle brackets without a space. So I don't know if people remember that, but uh, before C++ 11, uh, this would be like a shared phone operator. <laughs> so uh, we we need to have a space before C++ 11. C++ 11, it was fixed. We can have this uh, uh, two angle brackets because the templates inside of template uh, without uh, having the space. OK, so this is the host class, widget manager. And we decided we don't have to. We can have we can uh, have that as a as a aggregated. We decide to have it as a public inheritance of creation policy. It could be also a private one, by the way, a private inheritance bringing in the the function that we want. We could also have that as an aggregated, not on not only as a public inheritance. We're talking about public. What what does it mean, public inheritance, in terms of oh, accidentally polymorphism usage? Uh, the the nice part about having it as a uh, as a as an inheritance is that if if it uh, if it doesn't have members, uh, uh, empty base uh, uh, optimization is kicking in, and and it doesn't it doesn't uh, occupy even not one byte. So that's a, that's a that's a, a great uh, uh, optimization that we have in C++ that it it doesn't it doesn't uh, it doesn't cost anything. So the author decided to have it as a public inheritance. That's fine. And one of the things that we like to do to get things a bit shorter is using a type def and using is a C++ 11 syntax to have a type def here of widget manager of new creator policy of widget. Now, when you look at this code, at this type def, do you see any anything weird or any duplications of such? What do you think is duplicated here? So the world widget is duplicated. What do you think? That makes, makes sense. So that actually makes sense. We we have a widget manager, and when we instantiate it, or this is a type that we'll, we'll use when we use it, we instantiate. We instance we we create this, we build this this uh, type by passing the policy class. Uh, by pass the policy class is a template itself. We passing widget, which is kind of weird. Why do I need to tell the policy class? That it's a widget uh, in the widget manager. Wouldn't it be wouldn't it be nice if I just say uh, just op new creator and obviously it's for widget. So this is where template template parameter kicks in. It's a 
B11 feature, so it's been there since day one, but not uh, widely known and widely used, but this is a very powerful, if you are either a utility class, a utility module, a utility library that use templates and you want to make life easier for your clients, this is one of the things that you should be aware of. So before I'll talk about how it's being defined, the host class with this template template parameter, uh, this is how it's going to look like the application code, the type dev uh, widget manager of op new creator. So compare it to this one, there is no widget. We're not repeating that. This is actually super powerful and super cool. So what's the idea? The idea is that my creation policy is a template. So I'm by by changing the syntax from one form to this form, I'm saying creation policy is a template and it's a template with one template parameter. What is the template parameter? Is this one. And since it's a template parameter, uh, sorry, it's a template class. Whenever I use this template class, template class, I need to specify the whole definition of the template. So the creation policy is a template, right? Because it, that's what I'm saying. It's a template class. So I need to refer to something. So I need the T or created in this case. So I'm having widget. Why? Because when I, as the author of widget manager, I'm going to have a creation policy, whatever I've been passed, of widget. So the creation policy that I can accept is a template. If you if you pass me something that is not a template, there's going to be a compiler. Oh, why? The compiler will try to do some template instantiation here, but you pass you pass widget manager or something which is not a template, it's it's going to fail to compile. The second thing is it's a template with one single template parameter which is created. Now, the created, if you look very closely, I'm not using the created. It's actually redundant. So the even shorter syntax of this host class definition is without the the template parameter of the template template class. OK, so this is a template class and this is a template of a template class. Now, uh, if you if you notice um, closely, I'm yeah, I'm using the creation policy of a widget, so I don't care about the T. By the way, uh, it used to be class type name, I think is now also acceptable. Uh, it used to be only 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 class, but there is another benefit of having this syntax over this one. When I have a creation policy and uh, and I pass the creation policy of a widget, which is in this case it's a new, it's a new policy, new operator, operator new. I Let's say I want to use the same creation policy for other stuff, not only widget. I want to create, I want to use the same policy, which is operator new with gadget. So this is very powerful. Think about a creation policy of a pool. You have a pre-allocated pool and your creation policy is pool. It's like your own heap that you manage and you want everything that is happening in the host in widget manager everything to go into the pool and take chunk of data so if i'm passing the creation policy as a template parameter and not creation policy as of widget full stop then i'm opening myself to a more flexible usage of the creation policy because I can I can actually now create other stuff, not only widget, but other stuff uh, with the same policy. So this is super um, strong uh, design and very awesome. I don't know if, if people see that, uh, but it it's actually a very strong design and a, and a, and a very strong uh, 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 syntax and approach to to use the same policy for all the types that I would like to create. 
otherwise it wouldn't work. Now, uh, this is the syntax how we create a gadget in this case, but I can actually also create policy. I can create, sorry, widget. Um, and uh, the syntax is really simple. I'm creating an instance of the crea creation policy that would be new if I pass new here. And uh, that create would give me whatever I have. So if you look at the creation policy of new, new doesn't know anything. It's just going to do new of gadget, new of widget. So it's super convenient um, to have it. Now you could you could argue that I don't even need to inherit from the creation policy. I can actually use creation policy widget dot create just like I have it here. This is correct. This is correct. You don't you don't really have to inherit. It's just one option if you want to uh, use just the, the the function create. So what happened when I inherit from public widget manager has a public API create and I inside the widget manager I can actually call create uh, which would invoke the the parent create function, which is this one. But since this class this operator new creator doesn't have state. Uh, yes, you could actually uh, use it anywhere in your code by writing this syntax. And don't worry about runtime optimizer would optimize it very well to just the new operator in 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 the case of the new uh, creator. So hopefully, just by looking at this few examples, you already feeling the powerful approach of using policy based design. Tr try to imagine in your code how you can decouple and decompose behavior to multiple uh, policy classes and and start using it in your in your uh, base code in, a, in your base code uh, either your hobby or day job. One of the things that we could do, we can have template parameter with defaults, which is really nice. Like, let's say I don't want the users to bother with uh, any policy if it's just, uh, let's say it's a new, it's a new creator, so they can just uh, have just angle brackets, angle brackets, and and the default would be picked. So uh, this is one option that you can have in order to make your uh, users happy uh, less typing for them if they really want the new oper the operator new to be the default now there are all kinds of variations of how you can create the policy classes this is this is a variation instead of the template being on the struct uh, it is on the uh, member function the static member function um, it, it used to be supported more by all compilers. The other one, the other approach would have some issues, but this is old. Uh, we don't have these issues anymore in, in modern compilers in 2023, end of 2023, so don't worry. This is less, less desired uh, syntax, by the way. Uh, stick to classes. Stick to classes because it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's easier to, uh, to use. Um, yeah, classes, by the way, they provide you different types versus operator new creator with different functions. So there are different pros and cons to each. Uh, the author, Andre, uh, uh, encourage you to use the class version of the of the template, not the, fun the member function one. OK, so remember we talked about enrich policies. So what does it mean enrich policies? Enrich policies means that some of the not all the policy classes ha have the same API. They have some common API create. Or the creator policy create is a common API. But if you remember the prototype creator had set and get prototype because what happened is that in prototype I can have some 
instance that I want to say, I want to create more of these, and this Portak knows how to, it's like a factory. It knows how to create cl clones of, of the items that I need. So I can actually set and get prototype uh, replaced. Like I can have a, a specific uh, host that is hosting the prototype creator policy, and I can replace the the uh, uh, the prototype um, during one time. So uh, so this is enriched enriched uh, uh, API now. The idea behind it, behind this is pretty simple. When I using a specific policy, so I'm writing the code and I know that this line is instantiating a specific host class with a specific policy or policies. I'm aware of uh, of the specific uh, and and it's not it's not a generic code that I'm writing. It's actually I'm I'm a user of this code. I know what I'm using because I I'm I like a line before I said okay I'm using the prototype creator. So since I know that I'm using the prototype creator, I'm allowed to use the set prototype and get prototype, which are kind of enriched API. The idea is that if you if I accidentally thought that I using prototype creator, but I accidentally accidentally use operator new the the new creator. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, I'll have a compile error, compile time error because I'm using functions that are that doesn't exist in in the in the host class that inherits from the port from the policy. So it is very safe because I'm getting an immediate feedback from the compiler that I'm doing something wrong. So compiler would remind you. So that's that's a great that's a great thing. OK. Let's talk about uh, destructors of policy classes. So I already already hinted that there are multiple ways to host the policy classes. You can inherit public inheritance, and you can aggregate. So let's talk about public inheritance. So since it, since we're talking about public inheritance, public inheritance, there is an issue with public inheritance that I can actually convert a derived class to a a base class, and I can have a base class pointer, a base class reference, and and especially if I have a if I have a, a base class pointer, I can accidentally delete, right? I can delete through the base, and hopefully the derived class destructor will be invoked. But that's only going to happen if you are having a virtual destructor in the base class. I don't, otherwise, it is an undefined behavior to do what I'm doing here. Uh, it's uh, this is kind of legal. Uh, this comp the delete compiles fine, but it has an undefined behavior. So there are multiple ways, as I mentioned, to do that. One way is to inherit private and bring the the interface using the using um, uh, keyword. So you can have using the base class name, column column, the function name. Uh, unfortunately, if you have multiple like overloads, you bring all of them. But it is what it is. Uh, the other approach that uh, you can do is you can have the virtual destructor. Uh, sorry, not the, you can have the destructor being uh, protected. So having virtual destructor is no is is not is not something that we want to do because what's the point of paying for something that the whole idea of of templates and policy classes the way we present it is not to have virtual functions introduced. So one of the option is to bring the to bring the destructor uh, into protected. This is the old syntax uh, pre eleven of bringing the destructor. The, today you're not gonna write it this way. You're gonna have equal default semicolon. Uh, not not having an empty destructor. I, I left it as is just to show you because uh, I wanted to talk about the differences between the, the two. So this is this is how you can deal with uh, this issue, this accidental delete through the base class uh, and invoking a UB uh, because of that. And you don't want to have virtual destructor. Obviously, you don't want to pay for, for this overhead. Uh, why would you? OK, 
So uh, one of the things that uh, we have in template is that if you don't use something, it's not going like the compiler is not going to error if other types are not using it. What what does it mean? So so this is this is the same host that I showed you before with the template template parameter, and it has switch prototype. And the switch prototype is doing the following: it gets a new prototype widget because it's a widget manager, and then uh, reference to this, deleting the the old prototype, setting the new prototype. So all of that thing depends on the fact that my policy, which is this guy, uh, has uh, the creation policy has get and set prototype. Now let's say that I instantiate the widget manager with the malloc or new creation policy. None of them, none of this creation policy have this get and set port type. But if I'm if I'm instantiating widget manager, which is the host, with this specific policies, and I'm not touching the switch prototype, the compiler would not error. This is the big advantage of C++ templates. The compiler would have syntax checking, no semantic, so no symbol checking, no lookup, just syntax that you're not missing. I don't know, maybe semicolon and things like that which you need to do anyway, but it's not going to instantiate it and say, oh, you tried with malloc, but malloc doesn't have get and set prototype. That's not going to work. It's a it's amazing. It's an amazing feature of of the of the C++ templates, and it's true for every C++ template. Like if you have a, any C++ template and it has like 10 functions, but you're using only one. Uh, if you just instantiate the, the the class template and you just use one function, um, this is the only function that's going to be instantiated, which is which is a great it's a great feature. Uh, this is again related to enriched uh, enriched interface of of the class templates. Okay, let's talk about combining all of the like multiple of them into uh, a single host. So smart pointer, smart pointer can have a checking policy to check about validity of the pointer. Is it null? Is it not null? Maybe no check. Uh, maybe you want to enforce that it's not null. You can have all kinds of checking policy, and uh, you can also have threading model. Think about uh, atomic increment, atomic decrement, and all of that versus no, no atomic, no, no threading is like it's a single threaded. By the way, I had uh, in back in 2007, that was one of the options for C++ 11 smart pointers and uh, being a template with policies. But uh, the problem with that, it, it was very hard to uh, convert one smart pointer to another smart pointer with different policies. So this, this proposal didn't actually win. Uh, as far as I know, talking talking with, with people in back in 2007, uh, but that that's that's one option. So let's see how we can use it. So these are three different instantiation for three different use cases of smart pointer. All of them are widget. Two of them are no checking. So no checking of uh, validity of the of the pointer. One is enforcing that it's not null. And all of them are single threaded. But I could have multi threaded. So this is already giving you a glimpse of how powerful it is to start having this combined policy classes. The host doesn't care about, is it a single threaded, multi-threaded? It would invoke functions, and this function either would do something or do nothing, for example, in terms of the single threaded. No checking means we don't do any checking, might be a null, not null, sorry, it might be an empty function that does the checking, but enforce not null might check if it's not null and maybe throw an exceptions or anything else that you would like to do if it is null pointer. 
So checking policy would have a check T pointer member, and it would check before it's, it's doing the reference of the pointer. So there is an if. Let's say you want to pay for this if, so you'll have a checking policy that in force, it's not null. Threading model would, it would expose maybe a member or a type or inner type named log. You can think about it like the stood log guard, scope log, unique log, all of this RAII kind of logs. And this is a, an inner type that can be used, but for a single threaded, all of this would be a no op. So they do nothing in the constructor, they do nothing in the destructor, and they, they would be optimized completely away like out. And, and, and it's really zero cost obstruction, by the way. This is, this is super cool. So uh, let's, let's take a look at an example. So no checking. No checking, check key pointer, nothing. No, no implementation. When the compiler is do, instantiating it, and this check function is invoked, and the compiler says this fun function is basically empty, it goes away. It most, most likely would go away. Here is a, another policy of checking, but now the check is actually doing something. If the pointer is null, it would throw null pointer exception, it's just an, an exception that is inheriting from student exception, it's an internal exception in the public domain, in the public section, because it's a struct. And, uh, that's one way to enforce not not to throw an exception, which is valid. Uh, another another uh, policy. This is enforce not null. This is ensure not null. Maybe if it's a null pointer, maybe you can get a default value. And this is this is again super cool. Uh, if you think about, there are some uh, default dictionary. In in Python, where you where if the item doesn't exist, you get a default value. That's you can think about it like a policy uh, that Python has for this specific uh, use case. It's the same. When you start thinking about these options that you can use in your applications, it's really mind blowing. Here's how you're gonna use it in your host class. Just an example. There is an Smart pointer with an overload, overloaded, overloaded arrow operator that returns a T pointer. Here's a way to uh, uh, use the locking, the threading model locking uh, inner type guard of this, just just a, an RAII, just like scope lock and similar. It might be a no a no op for uh, single threaded threading policy. And then we use the check and we return the pointy here. And you can you can think about other approaches and other policy that you would like to do for your smart pointers to customize the way it behaves. One of the things that we would like to understand is how we can take the idea of behaviors and uh, decompose it to policies. The more orthogonal the, the policy classes are, the better you can actually have a very good design where they are actually independent of each other. We'll talk about what happens if they need some dependencies, but the best approach is just like this one. Checking policy and threading model, they, they are very orthogonal. They are a couple, they are orthogonal, independent, nothing, uh, no overlap. This is the easiest thing to manage uh, uh, policy classes. Uh, let's talk about customizing structure with policy classes because this is an important, uh, an important uh, point to, uh, uh, to demonstrate. Remember, I, I, met, I, I, I said that there is no way to customize the layout. OK, so the layout cannot be customized. The structure of the class type uh, cannot be customized. It's the behavior that you can customize. But policy based design have some walk around of this limitation. And this is an example um, of how you can use it. This is a, a way to uh, have a default 
smart pointer storage. So the, the policy is how do you store the, the, the pointer? You can store it as a reference type. You can post, uh, you can uh, store it, store it as, as a T pointer. So you have this get pointer set pointer functions and you can again have a third policy into the smart pointer host. And uh, in this case, since we decided that default smart pointer storage is a pointer type, we make it as a default one because most likely the smart pointer, most of the people would like smart pointer to have a storage of a pointer type and not a, something else, else like a reference type. So remember I talked about mixing different uh, host types. Now, the idea behind mixing host types is how can we mix, how can we actually convert one policy to another policy? In order to mix host types, you need to make sure that the policies are compatible with each other. If they are compatible, and I'll have, I'll have an example in the next, in the next uh, slide, if they are compatible, you can actually write copy constructor uh, assignment operator where it takes care of this compatibility. You can assign one policy to another policy and it works. If they cannot be compatible, and sometimes they can't, uh, they can't be compatible, so uh, it's not going to compile because it's not compatible. Um, you can all you can always think about converting one policy to another policy if the policy is less restrictive to a more restrictive. Think about cons to a non cons. Uh, it, it's it's easier to do that. Um, so the the one of one of the easiest ways to basically convert one host class to another host class is is to implement a conversion of policies. It's to initialize and copy the host class objects policy by policy. So example, we have a checking policy, just one policy to demonstrate, and I have a smart pointer copy constructor. And what we do here is basically we copy the pointy from the other that is passed here, and then we take the checking policy T and uh, in a initialize with other. Now, if checking policy T, whatever checking policy becomes in during instantiation, can accept another smart pointer uh, with T1 and CP1. If if this is if there is a function in checking policy that accept that and can copy the policy from other, then compiler would be happy. So it's really up to us, the authors, how we actually uh, writing our own conversion functions between different policies and between different hosts in order to uh, achieve that feature. It's a feature that you need to implement. You need to work on that in order to have this conversion. It's not going to come for free. And it's true for many things. If you look at smart point, like shared pointers, for example, how they there are all kinds of conversion between different types of the shared pointer. Uh, if if there is such conversion implemented somewhere, it's going it's going to work. So just as a summary, we get we reaching the maybe last five seven minutes of the of the talk. One of the things that I would like to reiterate is you need to really design your host class or classes very carefully understand the the behaviors so you you during design you identify multiple behaviors hopefully orthogonal ones so each type of the behavior might of behavior type could have multiple uh implementations and this each implementation is a different policy so a behavior is a policy class type okay uh, it's anything that can be done more than one way, and this will be your one of the template parameters. OK, so this is a behavior. One of the things that I liked in one of the quotes from the from the chapter is design constraint that are buried in class. Basically, think about a big class, a mammoth class, 
It's like magic numbers buried in code. You don't want to do that. You don't want ma ma magic numbers buried in code. You want magic numbers clearly described in a way that you can say, okay, this is something that I can reason about. And we showed creation policy, we, we showed we demonstrated locking policy, storage policy, all of these are behaviors that are orthogonal. Uh, ideally, the class, the host class, is a shell of policies. So you defer the behavior to the policy, which are template parameters. How many policies you want to have? You don't want to have more than six. Like between four to six is like less than four is also fine, obviously. Even one or two policy classes, policy classes is fine for the host. Um, more than, I think five, six is on the higher side. It means that you might do too much in your class, even the host class. So you're breaking solid, at least the SRP, the single responsibility. You want to have small policy classes, but also small host classes. You want to have type def? using x equal y to make things readable and easier to maintain so your user doesn't they don't need to write long and tedious uh template line orthogonal decomp decomposition and independent policies is the right thing to do so here's another example where you can decompose a class into policies and i'll demonstrate what happened when we start talking about two policies that might need to know about each other? OK, so let's say you want to have an array policy in your smart pointer. So either it's it's an array or it's not an array. So if it is an array, you have you have a subscript operator we can you can actually index into a specific location in the array. Because you you your smart pointer is allocating an array, you can you you have a subscript operator that you can access. If it's not an array, you don't have this enriched uh, uh, syntax. Now, what happened if your uh, host, which is smart pointer, uh, need to destruct? Because you have now two flavors of delete. Let's say a destruction is a different policy. You have a delete and you have delete of uh, uh, of an array. Right, a bit this this uh, uh, a square bracket. Uh, so by definition, if I have an array policy, I need to have an array destruction policy. So now I'm getting into two different policies which are not orthogonal. They have dependencies because I better not mix the wrong array policy with the wrong deletion policy. So I don't because it's 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 going to be an undefined behavior doing something like this because I don't want to have a delete when I have a, a, an allocation of array. I don't want to have a delete of non square bracket and the other way around. So uh, so how do you do that? I personally didn't have this uh, use case. I always had very clear separation between the policies, but there are a few options here that are listed. One is you can have a Boolean that is passed from one policy to another policy saying, OK, this is like the destruction policy would have a, a Boolean that says, OK, this is a uh, an array, so please behave like an array delete. Uh, but it, it is it is complicated. It, it increases the, 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 the complexity of your of your app. Uh, you should avoid that, obviously. Uh, but if you have no choice, Boolean is one way. Another way is passing one policy class as an argument to another policy class template. Then you know that these two are actually linked together as one policy. So so it's like a cascading policy if you think about it. So it's one policy that is passed to another policy that it is passed to the host. So this is one way to do that. Policies are everywhere. So uh, if you don't have it in your framework, in your applications, 
Uh, you probably should think if this is if if you have some some places where it, it is a good fit. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to point. To a few of the of the uh, examples of, of policy. So first of all, one of my favorite. Uh, since the end of the 90s, I used I used not using it. In the past few years, but uh, many years, but uh, ACE, the adaptive communication layer, is the first framework where I uh, got to know uh, of policies, and I'll, I'll show a few examples. Uh, my opinion, the deleter and unique pointer is kind of a policy. You can argue otherwise. Uh, maybe comparable functions in algorithms, maybe in maps, hash functions in unordered map, all of this can be looked as some kind of policies. Uh, and the list is huge. Like you can think about all this behavior, tempted behavior, uh, tuning, specializing. This this behavior can be can be seen as policy. So let's take a look at uh, lock. I I I picked one of the one of the lock, reverse lock. So there is a reverse lock and there is a reverse locking mechanism. OK, that is here. It's the template parameter. And. Uh, you can have all kinds of uh, uh, locking mechanisms. One of them is null mutex. Null mutex means. I'm doing nothing, but there's going to be there can be other mutex which are not null. But this is one examples where you you have a locking mechanism and you can pass either null mutex, maybe a real mutex, maybe a semaphore, it can be anything that you can uh, think about that is customized, uh, that you're customizing your, your locking, uh, your host class. So this is just a summary. I think policies are a great design choice for many use cases, so you should think about it. It can replace dynamic and runtime polymorphism very easily. Sometimes we have both. We have like in type erasure, you can have both. You can have templates and dynamic runtime polymorphism, uh, but this is this is for a different talk. Uh, uh, think about orthogonal policies. This is important to have a successful design. Think about template template parameter to make things more robust and easier for your users. Understand the fact that you have interface enrichment. If you're using the, the interface correctly, it's going to compile. If not, compiler would remind you that you're using enrichment interface with the wrong policy. Use type def to have better code maintenance. Uh, Avoid interdependencies between policies. So use orthogonal policies as much as possible. Now, before we go to our ways and, and uh, complete this session, I wanted to have a teaser, one slight teaser about type traits for the next. Uh, just it's just one small aspect of type traits that uh, we're going to talk about in the in the second in the second part. Uh, in in 2024 in January 2024. So think about this is just one use case, right? It's not it's not everything. Think about a class template that has A, B, C, D, E, and F uh, template parameters. But the idea behind A, B, C, D, E, and F, where we're actually using them, is that they are all part of the same nested class. So when I instantiate foo and I pass all this A, B, C, D all the way to F, it's all for EX1, the, the, the class EX1, and same for EX2. Type traits allows me to define, this is just one example, define EX1 and EX2 and define a, a, uh, a type def, an alias to uh, a, B, C, D, and all the way to F. Now, instead of having foo past all of these classes, all of these sorry entities, all these template parameters, I pass only E, X. Now, instead of having A and B, I have E, X of A, E, X and of B, 
and that makes things very short. And this is actually a real life example from from a, a, a framework uh, that makes makes this short uh, shorter form instead of having the left hand side. It's just one example of typed rates. Obviously, I'm going to show multiple examples next time. I just want to want to have a, a teaser for that. Uh, yeah, that's it for today. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, uh, oh, Gary, yeah, yeah, there's a there's a question. Uh, you are on mute, Gary. I can't hear you. Still can't hear you. I don't know if others can hear. Can other hear, Gary? No, people say no. Sorry, Gary, I can't hear you. No. Uh, feel, feel free either in Discord. So if you don't have the Discord link, please ping me LinkedInMeetup.com. I'll I'll send you the link. If you're not already in Discord, then we can you can ask that and I'll I'll reply. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thanks everyone for showing up. Have a good rest of your day. Have a good year. Have a good holidays. Thank you. Thanks.